Hi, oh yeah, so my name's uh, Sue McDess. I'm uh, from Oxford and uh, very grateful for you inviting me. Uh, first time in Poland, it's very good. I think you should hold it up a bit higher. Is that better? Yes, yes. Okay. that's how it works. <laughs> um, I just want to clarify the programme's wrong. I've never set foot in Great Ormond Street. <laughs> Did it show? Oh. Okay, so, um, uh, so as you know, I'm an, in, an anesthesiologist, but over the last few years, uh, I've got very interested in human factors and I do a lot of teaching in the simulation suite. So this talk is just slightly off piece and we're just going to talk a little bit about human factors. Um, so we all as clinicians and as sort of professionals sort of have a tendency to believe that what we... Speak up a little bit louder. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So we all tend to have a tendency to believe that uh, what we think is fact, when unfortunately it's often just opinion. Um, and as an opinion, it obviously might not be correct. So when we act based on a belief that something is a fact, and it turns out to not only be opinion but to be wrong, then that's when things can go spectacularly wrong. So we all need teams uh, in every aspect of our lives. Um, and the literature informs us that what influences team dynamics is uh, what we know, um, intervention that we can do to help develop leadership. And these, these things that sort of engender success are really role clarity, having good leadership, trust, exchange of protocols, which is uh, obviously a very useful part of the ERN, um, and a compelling reason to be a team. And we know that effective teams, um, they self-correct, uh, they're adaptable, they need to be cohesive and hold shared mental models of their task objectives and teammates. And organisations have recognised that teams can be more effective than the sum of their, the work of the individual. So we've sort of shifted from individual tasks to team tasks. And teams can take on more involved work than individuals because the team members can combine their diverse complementary capabilities to provide um, backup behaviour. Um, and uh, not only are organisations sort of changing from individuals to teamwork, but they're also becoming more interprofessional, they're more interdisciplinary, and as you can see today, they're more cross-cultural. And I think there's no uh, better example of this than the craniofacial multidisciplinary team. That's, that's Oxford. Um, so researchers agree that selecting individuals that have a collectivist view or a team value orientation, they're more engaged in teamwork than those that have an individual orientation. So in addition to the five sort of ideal personality traits, emotional stability, interestingly, has been found to be the most positively related to team performance. So when we look at successful astronaut teams, we can see that rather than being an ideal personality, uh, team performance is more about how the team members' personalities and their characteristics complement each other. And this is a scene from one of my favorite films, I recognize it, it's The Martian. And this, this film, I think, illustrates beautifully how different team members, different personalities can complement each other perfectly. Uh, and I think that's particularly relevant to a cohesive craniofacial team. So do human factors apply to anaesthesia or broadly speaking, surgery or perioperative care? So in the 1970s, um, airline pilots were asked the same question. They all dismissed it. The captain or the surgeon had complete authority for the safety of everyone on board. But unfortunately, believe it or not, their decisions were not always correct. They were sometimes career as well as life ending. So um, following several sort of fatal accidents with large scale loss of life, aviation, they finally sort of woke up to this and the importance of understanding and recognising human factors involved in error. And flying, as you know, is now the sort of safest form of travel. So the surgical and anaesthesia team has much to learn about human factors and safety from aviation and other high-risk organisations, which I'll just call HROs going forward. I mean, we shouldn't compare surgery to aviation, but there are obvious parallels. And uh, I, I've spoken to quite a few pilots when I've written this talk. They, they make quite an important distinction, which is they generally all fly the same plane every day. 
And I think the key difference with what we're doing is we're flying a different plane every day. But having said that, there are some parallels that we can learn from them. So the media is often very quick to blame pilots and after crash, but there are other team members like ground engineers or employment organizations that have contributed. And it's the same in medicine, it's multifactorial. So some of the most important human factors issues are sort of highlighted on this slide. Um, and they often affect trainees and other craniofacial team members. And the things to bear in mind, which you might not necessarily think about, are tiredness um, and situational awareness. And I'll talk about this more coming forward. So human failure often, often occurs across four key areas. That's organisational influences, unsafe supervision, uh, preconditions and the unsafe act. And so this is, I'm sure you've heard of the Swiss cheese model. So often different errors or holes in the cheese can all line up and then you get an error. So following several um, fatal air crashes, um, airlines now sort of empower the junior pilots to challenge the captain. Um, and I guess what I'm saying is, can we say the same is true across healthcare? So teams need something called psychological safety to prosper. And by that, what I mean is uh, it's inevitable that teams are all going to run into conflict from time to time. And in order to resolve conflict, teammates need to participate in an open and honest communication. And that can only happen if they don't feel worried about being judged or ridiculed by others on the team. And in essence, they need to have this license to speak up. And I think psychological safety can be enhanced by effective team briefs and during a debrief uh, members need to take a learning approach, diagnose areas of development and then they're more likely to feel comfortable to speak up. And of course leaders, which you all are in this audience, you all play quite an important role. So when leaders admit their own faults, then they can make others feel that they can sort of safely communicate errors that they make. So all in all, um, psychological safety has been shown to be critical for effective teamwork. An error is much more likely when we're hungry, angry, running late or tired. So halt is an easy one to use for that. And I think we need, I think as busy clinicians, we sort of forget these things. We're all sort of used to working 14 hours days, having eaten one bar and not gone to the loo for 14 hours and going into acute renal failure. Mm -hmm. So tiredness is a big thing and we all need to bear this in mind and it's a massive cause of accidents across aviation and rail. So strict guidelines are in place for taking regular breaks, but we need to make sure we ensure these. So in simple terms, situational awareness is sort of knowledge of what has happened, what's happening now and what might happen in the future. So it's a term you hear a lot in human factors. Um, and most of us stop for a break every few hours when we're driving, but can we say the same during a long operation? Sadly not. So, quite apt, we've now got Donald Trump, God help us. Um, <laughs> So a well-used method in aviation is to ask for a message to be repeated back to ensure it's heard and understood that there's no ambiguity. So pronouns such as that, this, them, it, they should be avoided when you're trying to convey sort of vital information. So responses to the question, what do you think? It's quite a powerful question. It can often reveal quite an amazing amount of information. Mm -hmm. I'll explore this a bit more. So I just want to briefly touch on human factors and ergonomics now. So HFE is a scientific discipline that so makes you, yeah. Kind of dips in and out all the time. Yeah. <laughs> like that. <laughs> Sorry. Like that. Yeah. Like eating a cornetto. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so yeah, that's a human factor right there. Isn't it? <laughs> so yeah, HFE. Uh, it's a scientific discipline and it, it basically makes it easy to do the right thing and hopefully difficult or impossible to do the wrong thing. So as humans, we're liable to make mistakes and we rely on personal performance, which is very common in healthcare. And it's not a fail safe method of ensuring patient safety. So HFE strategies can be described using this hierarchy of controls, which I'll show you in a second. It's arranged in a pyramid, as you can see. 
So starting at the bottom, which is the most effective, and then I'll move up to the least effective. So design is the most effective change we can make. And by this, I mean um, the equipment we use, the working environment, and these all aim to prevent errors. And design strategies like these, they're used in all UK safety critical in, uh, industries, and they account for around 90% of safety improvements. So in anesthesia, Equipment designed to prevent harm from unrecognised esophageal intubation, for example, um, includes video laryngoscopy, which uh, there's a picture of me there using a uh, video laryngoscopy. So what this does, it, it increases first pass intubation rates, um, but the benefits are it offers communication, um, it changes the intubation from me to we, so you can see my ODP there, you can see exactly what I'm doing. Um, and it allows the assistant to apply or adjust cricoid pressure. He or she can anticipate the next step and call for help if needed. So these features sort of flatten the team hierarchy and then they Im improve the recognition of an unrecognised esophageal intubation. And it obviously is fantastic for training. And I've spent a lot of time speaking with pilots about this. And in a cockpit, there are formal processes in place uh, to manage confirmation bias and cognitive dissonance. So. For example, the intubator should say, can you review the capnograph, you know, um, rather than saying that's in, isn't it? It's just a subtle difference. You're just saying, what can you see? And then that person is giving you their view. Um, so design of this working environment during laryngoscopy can be optimised to so position the screen in front of you so you can both see it um, and improve uh, the recognition of the tube being in the wrong place. Then moving up the pyramid to barriers, uh, these are strategies that aim to trap errors. So example of that would be the mandatory use of capnography. Uh, the whole multidisciplinary team should be trained to recognise capnography and waveforms and to understand the significance of a flat trace and not be afraid to say, should that, should that be flat? Are you sure you've got CO2 there? Um, and then other sort of barriers include the names, uh, using team members' first names, for example, or a verbal pre-induction in the safety brief during pre-oxygenation. Again, I've explained the importance of closed loop communication and standardised handover tools. Then moving up to mitigations, these reduce the consequences of an error. So they include crisis management tools, non-technical skills, and tools for regaining situation control. And then right at the top is, is obviously education and training. And obviously, these are essential for safety, but they're only going to be effective if other HFE strategies are in place. And so these are the things that most of us are involved in, such as simulation training, out of theatre workshops, flashcards, just things to help reduce skill decay. Um, I've, I've chosen to highlight unrecognised soft fuel intubation because <laughs> Uh, we did a UK-wide survey recently um, of airway-related deaths, and there were six paediatric deaths related to unrecognised esophageal intubation in theatre. Um, unfortunately, um, the least effective strategies are the easiest to implement and vice versa. So, of course, the least effective strategies are the least expensive, and that, that's why the, our hospitals push them. So our current healthcare system, the pyramid's inverted, uh, it's essentially turned upside down. So there's high, heavy reliance on high levels of human performance, uh, and that has a small and unstable foundation for safety. So I just want to highlight um, this audit project. So it's called the fourth national audit project of the World College of Anesthetists looked at difficult airway management. It's called the NAP4 study, which you can look up online. And they analysed reports of serious events arising from airway management and anaesthesia in intensive care and in ED. So they, they followed up with telephone interviews with 12 of the anaesthetists who reported to NAP4 and they were trying to find out what were the issues that led to these disasters. Um, and uh, they identified contributing human factors in every single case. Um, and I've sort of listed the main ones there, but uh, the most frequently were related to situational awareness, that was in nine cases, job factors in eight cases, so task difficulty, staffing, time pressures, person factors, so they said they were tired, hungry, stressed, that was in six cases, 
Um, but on the plus side, protective factors, which they said helped mitigate disasters were good teamwork, communication. So I'm actually going to stop now uh, and I'll save my thoughts on how I manage an airway for tomorrow. So, so I'll leave it there and take questions.